speed is of vital importance. And when one is in a hurry, it is sometimes necessary to take a shortcut, which was the case this particular evening. There are men in London who, out of shyness or sourness, have no wish for the company of others. Yet they are not averse to comfortable chairs and the latest reading material. For their convenience, a club was started which forbade its members from taking any notice of each other. If a member talked, it was a black mark against him, and three such marks rendered him liable to expulsion. Sherlock Holmes was neither shy nor sour, but he joined the St. Dennis Club because he found the atmosphere soothing. True, I'd always been diligent about not disturbing him here, but tonight I had come on a matter of the greatest urgency. I beg your pardon? Who oh, I... Excuse me. I thought you were Sherlock Holmes. That's not the point. You talked. Well, I, I only went... You went pst, and that's the same thing. Mr. Brandy. Take this gentleman's name. Your name, sir? Watson. Dr. John Watson. But you made a mistake. I'm not a member of your club. Not a member? How did you get in? Well, I... Uh, Brandy? You'll accompany me out, sir. I'm here on very urgent business. Our constitution forbids talk of any kind. Follow me, sir. And I'd like you to understand I'm not the sort of man who enters a club like this uninvited, but the circumstances happen to be extraordinary. Holmes! Well, I must ask you, sir, not to attempt to... I don't believe such an incident has ever occurred before. Well, really. I... Holmes! Shh. I've never been so humiliated in my life. Why didn't you speak up in there? Because it's against the rules of the club, old chap. Oh, hang the club! This desire for privacy can go too far. What if an emergency arose? Yes, and perhaps to prevent that happening again, we'd better move down the hall a bit. Now, you were saying... What if an emergency arose? You can speak up now, Watson. What I'm trying to say is, what if an emergency arose and your uh, presence is urgently requested that we can put a hand on you? But I'm here, my dear chap. You just disproved that. Oh, really? I'm only isolated here from triviality. Well, there's nothing trivial about this. There's a man waiting for you back at the flat, a man by the name of Dubeck, Claude Dubeck. He's had an experience that'll make your blood run cold. What sort of an experience, Watson? He watched a man being tortured. Tortured? We'll find a cab outside. Yes. Come along, then. Once outside, we immediately hailed a cab, and I began to tell Holmes what I knew of the case. Holmes sat in silence as we rode, and I knew that my explanations had done nothing more than rouse his interest in talking to Mr. Dubeck. Perhaps it was a nightmare. I'm no longer sure. But I saw a man being tortured, starved to death. I was powerless to help. I... Here, drink this. It'll do you good. Thank you. In it, true Frenchman will tell you that this brandy has to be sipped safer, but if you'll excuse me once. Poor devil. Maybe he's still alive. Mr. Holmes, you must find him before it's too late. Mr. Dubeck, we'll do our best to help you, but first of all, you must tell us who this man was and how you came to meet him. His name was Charon. Paul Charon. And how we came to meet him. Hmm. What day is it today? Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, then, then it was last Friday that it happened. You know, Mr. Holmes, I, I'm an interpreter. And I interpret nearly all languages. Now, since I'm French by birth, it is with this tongue that I'm principally associated. Now, I'm very well known in the hotels, and it occurs frequently that I'm called for at the strangest hours by travelers who get into difficulties. 
Now, I was not surprised, therefore, when I heard shortly before 11 o'clock at night, someone knock at my door. My name is Latimer, Harold Latimer. Forgive me for calling at such a late hour, but the man at the hotel said it would be all right. Oh, you need an interpreter? Yes. You do speak French, don't you? That would be the greatest of pleasure. Uh, what's your problem? Well, you see, someone from France came to see me on business. As it turned out, he speaks only French. And I, of course, can't even read the label on a bottle of wine. Oh, that's a pity. He's leaving tomorrow, and it's imperative that we settle our business tonight. I realize this is an imposition at this late hour. Uh, an interpreter and a doctor are the same in this respect. His hours are whenever he is required. Now, just a moment, I'll get my hat to go. Mr. Latimer had a cap waiting outside. I didn't think to give it more than a passing glance. However, there was a strange atmosphere as I entered. One can sense such things. I must ask you not to. I beg your pardon. I prefer the shades drawn, Mr. Dubeck. But they cut out the view. That's exactly their purpose. You'll forgive me, but I have no intention of permitting you to see the place to which we are being driven. What's the meaning of this? We shall find out soon. For nearly two hours we drove without my having the least idea where we were going. All the time I, I sat in silence, wondering what on earth could be this man's reason for kidnapping me. Whatever it might be, there was no possible use in my resisting. Mr. Dubeck. You're aware this is kidnapping, Mr. Letterman? It is somewhat of a liberty, I admit. We'll make it up to you. You may get out. Mr. Dubeck, Harold? Yes. Ah, well done, well done. No ill feelings, Mr. Dubeck, I hope, but <laughs> we couldn't get on without you. Now, what do you want of me? Only to ask a few questions of a French gentleman. Let us have the answers. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it. But uh, if you try any tricks, <laughs> you'll wish you hadn't been born. <laughs> you follow me? Put him in one of these, so as to move him more easily. What have you been doing to this poor man? That is no concern of yours. <laughs> Feel better? Cochon. Salaud bandit. You don't have to understand French to know that is not a compliment. <laughs> but no matter. Ask him if he's prepared to sign the papers. For your own good, be quick about it. Acceptez-vous de signer les papiers? Jamais. Never. <laughs> Tell him he is doing her no service. Vous ne lui êtes d'aucune aide. Laissez-moi lui entendre dire. He says, let me hear her say so. Tell him he'll go free if he signs. Signé, et vous serez libéré. <laughs> C'est alors que je ne serai plus jamais libre. He says, then he will never go free. <laughs> then he knows what awaits him. Translate that. <laughs> vous savez à quelles conséquences vous vous exposez. Peu m'importe. He says, he doesn't care. Stop that! 
It is only the beginning if he persists in being stubborn. <laughs> now let us try again and see if we can get better results. I was horrified at having to be a part of an affair like this. And even though I was only the interpreter, I felt guilty at not being able to give him any help. What could I do with Latimer on one side and Judd on the other, giggling with each question? Again and again, I, I asked him in different ways whether he would give in and sign the document. Again and again, I, I got the same reply. But soon, a thought came to me. I took to adding little sentences of my own to each question. Innocent ones at first, to see if I could get away with it. When our companion showed no sign of catching on, I played a more dangerous game. I asked him all about himself and learned that his name was Paul Charon. He was a stranger in London, that he didn't know what house we were in, that he was being starved to death. In another minute, I might have wormed the whole story out from under their noses, but for the interruption. Who is it? Oh, it's me, Lee. The door is locked. Get rid of her. Give me the gun. Micheline, dear, I thought you went to bed hours ago. I couldn't sleep at all. I can't think of nothing but Paul. Now, Micheline, there's nothing to worry about. But he should have been here two days ago. It isn't like Paul to do something like that. Something must have happened to him. Nonsense. I'll wager anything that he was delayed somewhere on business. Then he would have written to me. If I don't hear from him by tomorrow, I will go to the police. Uh, Micheline! Paul, he's in there. Micheline! What's the matter with you? Have you taken leave of your senses? But it was Paul's fault. It was nothing of the kind. But I did, I heard. Would I lie to you? If Paul were in there, wouldn't I tell you? Judd is in there. Judd, that's all. Oh, Warrell, well, I don't know what's happening to me. Now, now, darling, it's only a case of nerves. You'll be all right after a good night's rest. But it never happened like that before. You've probably never been under such a stress. But it's foolish. If something happened to Paul, you would have heard about it by now. The fact that you haven't is proof enough that all is well. You are probably right. Of course I am. I'll take you back upstairs. You perceive we have taken you into our confidence over some very private business. Shameful business. <laughs> Necessary business. But it would not be to our interest if you spoke to anybody about it. <laughs> Therefore, I am paying you a fee such as you have never before received in your life. There will be more the next time you come here. Thank you. However, I don't place all my faith in money. Therefore, I must warn you that if you speak to a single soul about this, we shall know about it. And you will pay for it with your life. <laughs> this man, this evil man, escorted me back to the carriage and took his place opposite me. We drove for about half an hour, and uh, the shades were drawn as before. And then we came to a stop, and he ordered me out. I walked for a mile or so, and then I found myself at Wadsworth Common, and there took the train to Victoria Station. I see, and there, I presume, your adventure ended. Yes. Now, I should have gone to the police right away, but I feared for the man's life. Now, Mr. Holmes, someone told me that you... you worked with a complete discretion. Oh, you can be assured of that. Mr. Holmes, would you please try to find him? I'll try, but you must realize that my success depends almost entirely on your memory. Well, I've told you everything. Only everything you were able to see. 
I've told you everything. I repeat, Monsieur Dubec, only everything you were able to see. I don't understand. Well, on the way to the house, you saw nothing because the blinds were drawn in the carriage. Uh -huh. But you could still feel and hear, couldn't you? Now, as you were going along, could you tell whether it was a rough or smooth road? Oh, yes, now I know where you're getting at. Well, during the first part of the trip, the road was smooth. Mm -hmm. And, and then we, we seemed to turn off on a country road. A country road? Yes. Now, when you were going along that part of the road, mm. did you hear anything like cattle or poultry or sheep? Sheep? Yes, that's what I heard. Now, think hard. Was there anything else? Oh, well, oh, no, I, I remember. I remember a, a horn, a fork horn, something like a, a coal barge passing by. I see. Now, what part of the journey would that be exactly? Toward the end, I'm certain. Was there anything else that you can remember? No. No. Oh, yes, something about the house. Yes, we left the house, and, and then we seemed to, to pass through a, a, a huge storage room. Yes. And under the floor, I heard something like rushing water. Water? Yes, a stream. But it, it couldn't be, but, but that's what it seemed like. Thank you, Monsieur Dubec. I think I have all the information I require for the present. Have you already found out where he is? No, but I have all the facts at my disposal. It's now only a question of time. Oh, please, Mr. Holmes, you don't give my name, because if they ever found out that I've been here... You can depend I... upon my keeping your confidence, Monsieur Dubec. However, I would urge you still to be on guard. I'll be careful, Mr. Holmes. Good. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Watson. Good night. Good night, sir. You were listening to what Dubeck had to say. Have you any theories? Mm, in a vague sort of way, yes. Well, let's hear it then. Well, now, it seemed to me that this young French girl had been carried off by this English chap, uh, Latimer. Oh, but carried off from where? Oh, from Paris, I suppose. Well, the young girl could speak English fairly well, but the young man couldn't speak a word of French. Inference, the young girl had been in England some time, but the young man hadn't been in France. Well, then we can presume she came over on a visit to England and this man, Harold, persuaded her to run away with him. More than likely, Watson. Then this Sharon, the prisoner, the brother or guardian, decides to come over on a visit from France. He meets Latimer and his associate, and then for some reason decides against signing away the girl's fortune, of which he is presumably the guardian. The men then resort to force. Excellent, Watson. I'm quite certain that you're not far from the truth now. Well, it's only simple logic. Yes, and with simple logic, we'll find the house. It must be here somewhere. And when we finish translating the facts that Dubec has given us, an X will mark the spot. Now, let's see. Sorry to disturb you, Doctor. Would you mind getting your coat? We'll pick up and stray it on the way. You found it? I believe so. Holmes, do you think we should find you back in case we need an interpreter? Now, that's an excellent idea. Hmm. And from what I've heard, I believe these may come in handy. Right.
De Beck had his lodgings just across the river, and we decided to walk there. If you're looking for Mr. De Beck, he left about an hour ago. Can you tell us where? Oh, I don't know. I only know he drove away with a gentleman in a carriage. Well, did the gentleman leave his name? No, sir. Uh, was he by any chance a rather tall, handsome-looking man? Oh, no, sir. It was a little gentleman with glasses. Did nothing but giggle all the time. Uh, thank you, madam. <laughs> Even the weather seemed to be against us, and as we found our cab and started on our way, it began to rain. According to Holmes's calculations, we had a considerable way to go, and we had to go fast if we were to be in time. London streets in the rain are a handicap to any carriage, so there's nothing for us to do but hope and wait. Amorji. Come then, Amorji. Does he still say no? He asked for food. Have mercy on that poor man. He will be fed the moment he signed the papers. Tell him that. Signez, mon vieux. Et un pas vous sera servi. Je n'en peux plus. Je signerai tout ce qu'on voudra. Comme d'un amorgé. He'll sign. At last. Feed this man. It would be foolish to spare him, only to have to kill him again. Kill him? And you broke your promise. You spoke to Sherlock Holmes. That's not. That's true. There's no point in lying, but you couldn't tell him where we are. And even the famous Mr. Holmes could never deduce that. The men come. Quick, open the trap. Aren't you two? Down there. mine. I'm her husband. It belonged to me. But he controlled it and wouldn't sign it over to me. He found out you were a thief. You can't take me to jail. I only tried to get what was coming to me. I'll see that you do. Oops. 